Good morning. Thank you for coming out on a rainy day to worship at the Storm Lake United Methodist Church. Um, Jesus promised us that where two or three are gathered in his name, he will be there. So Jesus is here with us today as we worship and praise him. I just pray that everything we do here in the sanctuary during this hour will glorify him. And I pray that each of you will feel Jesus' presence and that you will hear God speaking to you, a message that is just for you. We're going to start with a few announcements by Marjean. Good morning. First of all, I'd like to remind you again to sign the attendance pads at the end of the, each pew and pass them down. I also want to encourage you to get onto our Facebook pages and our website. The website is slumc.weebly, that's W-E-E-B-L-Y, dot com, to really keep updated on the things that are going on in the church. Also, Matt Collins, I'm going to have you stand up. Matt is in the sound booth today. Matt has started a YouTube page, and you can go to that. It's S-L-U-M-C space service, where he can edit all of our services, and they're all on there. So Last Supper Drama is on there. And because our cameras have not yet been synced with our new sound system, we're not able to zoom in, but he was able to edit that and cut it in. So once again, all small letters, S-L-U-M-C dot service, and you'll be able to, not, I said dot, didn't I, space service. Um, those are in the bulletin flyers if you want to pick one up on your way out. <clears throat> you probably all received a, an, uh, a schedule of greeters this week. So I want to just remind you that if you cannot be a greeter that particular Sunday, please call someone else on the list and try and switch. And if I don't have you on this year, you will be on next year. Women in Mission will meet uh, Wednesday, this Wednesday, May 1st, in the chapel in room 104. That is at 1.30. You'll also want to take note that Carol Miller, our former pastor, Matt Miller's wife, uh, has uh, pancreatic cancer in Des Moines. Again, you can pick up flyers in the back and they'll have her information on there. So I know they would appreciate our prayers, letters, fun fun little anecdotes, anything you can think of. And Jamie Cutler is retiring. I announced that a couple weeks ago. Also, there's information back in the narthex if you would like to participate in that. Now it's time for our birthdays. Seems like I've forgotten something. I have. <gasps> Courtney. Courtney would like to show her two first place medals. <laughs> Congratulations, Courtney. Okay, birthdays are Jennifer Morrell, Drew Schwent, Jennifer Hecht, Brent Lau, Gabe Barnett, June Bryan, Kim Carver, Marie Feeblestad, Dave Skipstead, Matt Brostad, and Mike Brostad. Please join in singing Happy Birthday. Now, if you would, please stand and join in singing the opening hymn, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, number 139. <laughs> Oh. 
call to worship. Come to the vineyard of God. We see Christ, the vine of great love. Drink from the waters of life. We live in the light of God's grace. Come to the vineyard of God. All are welcome here. Please join in the opening prayer. God of love, plant us in the soil of your grace. Nurture us with the strength of Christ, the vine of everlasting life. Enlighten us with the wisdom of your spirit, which flows through us today and all days. Abide in us, that we may abide in you and live in your love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. confession. Merciful one, you know when we are afraid to love. You know when we are too cowardly to show mercy. Remind us again that perfect love casts out such fears. Surround us and strengthen us with your perfect love, even in the face of our imperfections. Imbue us with a love so strong with such growth towards perfection that we may cast aside our pride and embrace the power of love. Please be seated and hear these words of assurance. Christ is the vine, we are simply the branches. If we abide in Christ, Christ's words will abide in us. Ask for whatever you wish in Christ's name and it will be granted. In the name of Christ, you who seek forgiveness are forgiven. In the name of Christ, you who seek forgiveness are forgiven. We come to God in prayer with humble hearts and serious minds. Lord, I just pray that you will hear the prayers that are on our lips, that are in our minds, that are on our hearts. Lord, I want to lift to you this congregation. You know the needs of these people here, and I pray that you will meet each person at his or her point of greatest need. I want to especially pray for Pastor Caboco as he is at this conference, Lord, and I just pray your blessing on this conference as they make some major decisions for the United Methodist Church. Lord, our church longs to serve you. We long to honor you and to give glory to your name and to be at work as the United Methodist Church in our, our community. So, Lord, um, bless this conference. Might they make wise decisions. I pray, Lord, for those who are suffering and in trouble. I want to especially lift to you Carol Miller as she battles cancer, Lord. Surround her and her family with your healing presence. Be with all those who are struggling with a physical illness. Be with those who need spiritual healing, mental healing as well. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. I pray for this 
the community of Storm Lake, Lord. Um, you know the needs that are here. You know the needs are immense. I pray for people in our community who are struggling to make ends meet, for people who are going through a divorce, Lord, and, and uh, struggling to meet the needs of their children as they struggle through their own insecurities, their own problems. Lord, you know the needs are immense, and I'm just praying that you will meet people where they are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. I pray for the world, Lord, for the countries who are experience, experiencing war, for those countries who would bring evil on others. I pray for our own country, Lord, that is seeming so divided right now. Might you find a common thread that can unite all of us. I pray for President Biden, Lord, that he might make wise decisions as we travel such a, a difficult road ahead. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for listening to our prayers, for answer, answering our prayers, and through all the good things that happen, may you receive the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now, Bob Bennett has an announcement here about our organ. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm here to talk about the organ and uh, to set a little history. There's a number of people in this room who probably aren't as old as this organ. So I'm here to present a little history about Opus 65. Has anybody ever heard this organ referred to by name and number? That's a name and a number provided by organ builders over the years, and this is the Opus series. It's number 65, and it was given to us by Obedient Organ Company. And um, so I'm here to provide somewhat of an update on how we got where we're at. Early in the 90s, we were experiencing a persistent and recurring problems with the then current organ. And according to my notes, there were evaluations made by 10 different organ builders, including Casavant. Casavant's kind of like a Cadillac of organ builders, and they've been around many, many years. And, and there's a few Casavant organs in the neighborhood in Sioux City for sure. The general conclusion was that the, a rebuild would be as expensive as replacement. In October of 1995, a gift of $100,000 was made by Alma Davidson toward the purchase of a new organ. And I'm not sure at this point, nor, nor then, but I think there was a time limit put on how long we had to spend that money. So soon after, there was a task force appointed, and our pastor at the time, Claire Fowlerbeck, announced that with that 100000 and other gifts that we'd had, we had $140,799 in the organ fund. The task force then began visiting churches to see and hear different styles of organs under the guidance of our consultant, Dr. David Volkerts. Considerations were also made for the church remodel project with Carl Sandquist, uh, the consultant on the, on the remodel job. By July of 1998, the task force recommended a obedient organ company to build a tracker organ with a second gift then of $80,000 from Francis Husenfeld, uh, the congregation then approved the purchase of this instrument in November of 1998. We still haven't turned the century here. A lot has happened. After the remodel in January of 2002, the congregation carried into the sanctuary a disassembled organ. Was anybody here, here that day? I was. There was a semi out front. This instrument was in pieces, in boxes. And they had it laying on, we laid them across all these pews in a certain order. There were people out there directing us in. And uh, one of the things I do recall is you'll notice how close it is to the ceiling. 
That meant that the whole top area could not be tipped in. It had to be lifted up and slid in because it won't tip that being that close. That was obedience miscalculation. <laughs> Just about every sentence in here leads me off into some story about what happened during this time. I didn't want to take up all of Joan's time today, so I'll continue. So uh, the craftsmen from Bedient assembled this organ and, and voiced it to play. That's when Opus 65 was born. This is a tracker type organ. Trackers are thin strips of wood that run from the keyboard to the valve on the pipes. They are made of Alaskan yellow cedar. The organ case is white oak and it's been stained to integrate with the wood trim of the church. There are other types of wood used also, like blackwood, maple, poplar, and mahogany. The pipes are made of an alloy of 2% tin and the rest is lead. The front pipes are gilded with 23%, the mouths on those front pipes, that gold area, and that's 23, 23 karat gold. There are a total of 1,036 pipes in this instrument. The wind for the pipes is supplied by a blower and bellows in the basement. There's a lot going on in this, in this box of pipe and on the front, and it weighs 12,000 pounds. Another story some other time. Okay, on April, April 28, 2002, the organ was consecrated and dedicated with a recital played by Dr. David Volkerts. Dr. David Volkerts is from Cedar Rapids and he's quite an accomplished organist and he led us through this entire process. We thought it was very deserving to have him play that recital. Now I'm gonna ask you to step forward to 2016, September. How are we keeping up with the pictures here? Good. In 2016, we had to make some repairs to our organ. Some of the pipes, especially the ones out front, were collapsing on themselves. They were bending, they were falling down, and they had to be rehung. And it, it caused us to do a complete revoicing, you know, tuning, if you will, um, was done. And it's not uncommon to have a, a pipe organ be revoiced uh, at least partially every 15 to 20 years. So that's our organ in a nutshell. What's up? Bennett usually gets up here and has got to talk about something more than what, what meets the eye. Well, Opus needs a little attention. It needs some love. I want you to turn your, your attention to the organ, and if you get a chance, walk up and take a look after the service. But those buttons on either side of the keyboard are called stops. The one on the left is called swell, the one on the right is called the grate. We're having problems with the swell. If you'll notice that there are two stops with black tape on them. Uh, those tape, that tape is just a reminder not to pull them out. These, the cylinders that look like this, that they're, they're connected to, don't work anymore. And this is one of them, I've taken it out. It only takes 20 pounds of air to operate these, and I, I've had 70 pounds of air on here and it doesn't move it, or any at all. So, it's been about two years. We've been looking for pipe. We're looking for cylinders. We've been on the internet. The company that originally built them is out of business. It's gone. It's been bought out. Their website's still active, but nobody answers the phone. Been waiting, Bedian has been aware of our problem since it began, <clears throat> and um, we've been kind of waiting for them to remodel somebody else so we can buy their used parts. And that hasn't happened. There's been no success for that. In the meantime, Bedian has located, um, first of all, for terminology, these are pneumatic, they were operated by air. Obedience using an electronic solenoid now that's built in Germany, and they're using it quite successfully. And so, um, as our as our cylinders, our pneumatic cylinders gradually fail, um, we are experiencing only problems problems on the swell. So, they recently stopped by to recommend and see what our problem is and recommend a fix. 
And since these pneumatic cylinders are no longer available, um, they're proposing using electronic solenoids to replace them. And they agree that fixing only the swell right now instead of converting the entire organ makes the best sense because the rest of the organ is working fine. But the swell is going to continue to have problems. And my thought is that if we fix the swell, I'm going to have got, I've got eight stops there and I've got two that don't work. If we fix the entire sw swell, I'm going to have six pneumatic cylinders that I can use someplace else in that organ to, d to delay spending any more money. The cost to convert the swell is $10,850 plus travel and per diem for the crew. These people come up here from Lincoln. It's a two-day process, so the, the, the travel is a fixed number and the per diem is only for an overnight. The expenses are outside the trustee budget and we're asking for help. This is our church, this is our organ, and this is our building. We can bind together and, and get this organ back into good playing condition. And we, if you'll take some time to think about what you can contribute to this project. In May and June, a special collection will be made during the worship service for Opus 65. Use the envelopes in the meantime in the, that are in the pews. Drop a contribution at the office. Mail it in. Get it to us any way you can. If we can raise seed money for Ragbri in a few weeks, we can raise enough to fix Opie. Thanks for your support. asked Laura today to bring something special. Do you know what this is? Yes, it's a baby goat. And Laura, how many babies did this mom have? Four. Four babies. That's unusual for a mother goat to have four babies. So there was a problem. What was the problem? Uh, this one was born a little small. The first 24 hours they're supposed to be up on their feet and he was not looking like he was going to get up. So mom and I took him home and now he's in the house being a bottle baby. Okay, and that means a lot of extra work for you, right? Tell me what you have to do. Uh, in the beginning we were getting up every two to three hours and feeding him. And now it's only every, about four times a day, every six hours. So it's weaning down. He's about four weeks old now, so. So you must really love this little critter a lot to spend all that time and all that energy taking care of him. She had to at first get up every two or three hours to feed him. And, and you're four. That's great. Three of them were doing okay, but this little guy probably wouldn't have survived, except that Laura loved him enough to take him into the house and feed him a bottle. She got up every night many, many times during the night to take care of him, and she cleans up after him. She makes sure that he's fed and warm and happy. You know, that reminds me a lot of all of you. When you were first born, you couldn't do anything, right? Your parents had to, they do, your, your parents had to get up in the night to feed you, they had to change your diapers when they were dirty, they had to burp you when you had a tummy ache, that your parents took such good care of you. Why do you suppose they did that? Yes. 
so that, so that you could survive. You know why they wanted you to survive? Because they loved you so much. They love you so much that they were willing to pump a lot of time and energy into you to make sure that you would grow up strong and healthy. You know, that reminds me of God because God loves you so much. You, if, if you know how much your parents love you, multiply that. And, and God loves you even more than that. God longs to have you talk to him. God longs to have you be part of one of his children in his big, big family. God loves you and wants the very best for you. And God knows what the very best for you is. Isn't that wonderful that we have a God that loves us so much? Just like Laura loves this little goat, just like your parents love you. I think we need to thank God for loving us so much. Can we come to God with humble hearts and serious minds? Oh, gracious God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for wanting to guide us and care for us. Lord, may we return some of that love to you. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Laura, a special thank you. Can the kids pet the goat? A special thank you to Laura for bringing her little critter here this morning. He's just such a cutie. Thank you. You, you can touch him, and then you can choose a candy bar if you want to. You don't have to touch him, but if you want to feel how nice and soft he is. Isn't it soft fur? Yeah. You're right, he is. So we just approach him very gently, don't we? Tell Laura, thank you for bringing such a fun thing for the children's ma Yeah, that was nice. Yeah.
Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The gospel reading is from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. Loving one another. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how, showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is, a real, this is real love, not that we love, loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us. And his God is, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testif testify that the Father sent his son to be the savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the son of God have li God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we li live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are not afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command, those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Levi. You did such a nice job and such a beautiful scripture about love. We're talking about love today. Um, God's love for us, our love for God. Uh, I have a friend, and she said, I'm really concerned because my husband never says, I love you. I, I know he loves me, but why doesn't he ever say, I love you? And so one day she asked him, and he said, well, on the day we got married, I told you I loved you, and nothing's changed. Now, are there a few husbands in the congregation that can identify with that husband? Actually, I think all of us can probably identify with the woman. We all need some affirmation about being loved. We all want to know that we are loved. We are born with this innate need to be loved and to give love. So um, we, we studies show that um, we live happier lives, healthier lives, and longer lives if we, if we are loved. And I think we probably spend much of our life trying to cultivate loving relationships or um, trying to maintain the loving relationships that we have. Love is really important. And so today, as we read this scripture about love, uh, I want to unpack it with you. I, I want to think about two things. First of all, what does this scripture tell us about God? And secondly, what does that scripture tell us about ourselves, about, about you and I? Um, God is defined in this scripture as a spirit, the spirit of love. 
In fact, the scripture says God is love. God is the very essence of love. God is a creating God. He used this love to create everything in this world. He created the birds of the sky, the fish of the sea, all the animals, and then he created mankind. And he looked at his creation and he said, it is very good. I love this creation. And I love the picture that's painted in Genesis of God walking with Adam and Eve, talking with Adam and Eve in this beautiful garden, God supplying all of their needs. And then, because God gave mankind the ability to choose, Adam and Eve chose to sin, to disobey God. And that interrupted that beautiful relationship that God had with man. But God said, I long so much to be in a, in a relationship with these people that I've created, these people that I love so much. So he said, I am going to come down to earth. I am going to live with them. I know that I will experience hatred. I know I will experience rejection. I know I will experience pain, both physically and spiritually. But I want this relationship so badly that I am willing to come down to earth to live with these people I've created. And so God came and he showed us love, love like we could never understand. He died on the cross. He gave up his life. He suffered pain for us because he loved us so very much. When we know how much God loves us. And when we accept that love, it changes who we are. We become happier people. We become more self-confident. We aren't so worried about what other people think about us. We aren't so worried about failing. We're, we're willing to branch out to try new things. Because God loves us. God loves us, and he'll hold us. And if we fail, God will be there to pick us up. And if we make mistakes, God will forgive us. When we know all of the, these things about God, it changes who we are. It changes how we set our priorities. It changes how we set our goals for our life. I love the scripture in Romans 5. There it is. God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us on the cross. That scripture starts by saying, you know, it might be possible for somebody to die for a good person, for a good cause. But God came down and gave his life for us while we were still sinners. God loved us anyway. God forgives us. God wants to help you. He wants to help you become the very best you can be. So that's a beautiful thing that we learn about God from this scripture. God is love, and his love for us is so immense, we can't even begin to understand it. It was uh, an, an important thing for first Christians to understand that Jesus was God, that God loved them so much. Let's look at the second scripture here. This is Paul. Uh, Paul's prayer for the Christians at Ephesus. It comes from Ephesians chapter 3. I pray that you may have your roots and foundations in love so that you, together with all God's people, may have the power to understand how broad and long, how high and deep is Christ's love. May you come to know his love, although it can never be fully known, and so be completely filled with the very nature of God. This is God's prayer for each one of you, that you might know how great his love is for you. When we become Christians, when we, we, we accept God's love into our lives, it changes who we are. We start to look a lot more like Jesus. Um, so, um, God's, God is a spirit of love. And the scripture tells us that that spirit of love can live inside of us. We can have the spirit of God living inside of us. You know, that's almost a difficult concept 
to comprehend that God lives in us, that spirit of love. He chose to live in us. So, so what is our response to God giving us that spirit of love? Well, we should be very grateful to God, first of all, thanking God for everything he has given us, this life, this, this beautiful world he's placed us in. We should be very thankful. But there is another commandment that goes with this. God commands us to reflect this love, to share this love with the world. God longs to work in us and through us, to give love to everybody in this world. Well, what does that look like? Um, first of all, let's look at John 13. This is Jesus' commandment. This is Jesus' commandment at the Last Supper, when I'm sure he felt it necessary to share the very important things, the things that he wanted the disciples to remember, the things that he wanted the disciples to act on. So could we have the other scripture? The, there it is. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. And now I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, and Jesus knew he was going to give up his life the very next day for this, his disciples. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. It's when people see God's love in our lives, pouring through us out to the world, that people realize we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And you know, Jesus modeled this for us. For three years, he modeled this love for us. Think about the love that he had. He reached out to people who were untouchable. The lepers, the blind men that sat by the, the city gate, he reached out to all of them, he touched them, he healed them. He healed the untouchables. Think about Jesus reaching out to the sinners. I think about the adulteress, the woman thrown at his feet, caught in the act of adultery. And he knelt down to her and he said, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. A God of second chances. God who says, I love you so much, I can forgive what you've done wrong, and you can start over. Jesus reached out to the social outcasts. I think of him meeting at the Samaritan woman at the well. The Samaritan woman, <sighs> Jews would not even talk to Samaritans. They wouldn't be in the same room with Samaritans. They wouldn't use the same cups as Samaritans. They were Samaritans were total outcasts, but there's Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman. And not only did he talk to her, but he offered her life-giving water. The water I will give you will well up inside of you to eternal life. He offered her this beautiful gift, and he identified himself to her. I am the Messiah. The first person he identified himself to was a social outcast. And then he commissioned her to be the first disciple to the Samaritans. She went off and invited all of all of the people she knew to come back to Jesus. Do we reach out to the social outcasts? Do we reach out to the sinners? Do we reach out to the untouchables? Jesus even reached out to, to his enemies. I remember the Roman centurion that, that came to him and said, my child is sick and dying. And the Romans were the enemies of the Jews. The Jews didn't like Romans. But Jesus took pity on this Roman guard and said, yes, your child is healed. What a beautiful gift to a person from the group of people that would nail him to the cross. Jesus loved the children. Let the children come to me. The disciples said, no, they're too loud. They'll get in the way. They might do inappropriate things. No. And Jesus said, bring the children to me. For to such as these belongs the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus blessed those children. Are we blessing our children? Are we reaching out to the people who really need us? Are we modeling Jesus' love to the world? Are we allowing God's love to flow through us so that we can reach others? Uh, let's look at the next scripture. Because when this love really takes hold of your life, when you're reaching out to others, there's a power 
There is a power in that love, a power that we cannot understand, a power that I don't think we have begun to tap into. This is the Ephesian scripture. How very great is his power at work in, you, in us who believe. This power works in us who believe. This working in us is the same as, this power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at the right side in the heavenly world. The power that we have that is at work in us is the same power that raised Jesus from the grave. Wow. Do we tap into that power? You know, when we do, we see miracles happen. And I want to close with a story that illustrates this. I prayed to God for an assignment where I could use the nurturing, loving gifts that he was pouring into my life. Two weeks later, I met a little girl, a little girl who had no family, a little girl who was the ward of the state, who was all alone in this big world. And when I met her, I noticed there were scratches and bruises and bite marks on her arms. Those were self-inflicted scars that told about how she felt about herself. And as I spent time with her, I heard over and over again, I'm so dumb. Nobody could love me. I hate myself. And I determined that I would pour every ounce of my being that would show her that she was loved. I started sending notes to her that said, I, I love you, I hope you have a good day. I started doing things with her. And you know what happened? All those marks on her arms healed up. I, I stopped hearing, I hate myself, I stopped hearing nobody could love me. She wanted, she started to want to learn to read. She started to want to hear stories. She wanted to try new things. She had a new self-confidence. All of this was the power of love. And it was like a miracle unfolding before my very eyes. This is the power of love to work miracles. Jesus said, greater things than I have done you will do. We won't do them by ourselves. We will only do them as the power and power of love works through us to reach out. Do you know somebody that could use a little more love in their life? When I befriended this, this child, there was another child that, that needed that love, but I knew I didn't have the time or the energy to, to meet her needs as well. This little girl was about 12, and her mother had died about a year ago, and her father had remarried, and his new wife didn't want to have anything to do with the child, so she was sent to an institution to live, and, and you could see the, the sadness and the hollowness in her eyes. She stopped eating. She was dying spiritually, but then she stopped eating, and she was dying physically. She was dying physically and spiritually, and so she was sent to another place to live. And I, my prayers to this day go with that child. And I just hope there was somebody who could reach out and love her, because one person loving her would change her life. Do you know somebody in your life that needs more love? Love changes the world. Love is what will conquer evil. Love will conquer hate. But we have to reach out and give it to people. And if you don't know somebody right now that you feel needs more love, I invite you to ask God for that assignment. Say, God, give me this assignment where I can love, where your love can pour through me into someone else, where I can change the world. And I can promise you, God will give you an assignment. Be careful what you ask for, because it might not be easy. But this is how we, as Christians, change the world.
by reaching out in love. So um, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me this prayer, and then as the now singers sing, I want you to think about. Yeah, I love you too. As, as the now singers sing, I want you to think about where God is leading you, where, where God wants you to reach out and pour a little of his love, his love that works through you to other people. Where is God calling you? I can guarantee he has an assignment for every one of you. You are here not by accident. You are here because God has an assignment for you. So let's just start with prayer. And repeat after me, gracious God, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for pouring your Holy Spirit into my life. I love you, Lord. Use me to be your disciple. Amen.
join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and, and the, the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. This is the time in the service when we give back to God, so the ushers will wait upon us for the morning offering.
You have held nothing back in your love for us, not even your son. How we marvel at that kind of love and how we long to reflect a portion of that devotion back to you. As we dedicate our offerings to you, lead us away from the tendencies to hold back and worry that there will not be enough. Help us to live as the people of love and abundance you have called us to be. In Christ we pray. Amen. from this place today to sow seeds of love and then sit back and watch those miracles flow. Thank you for coming today. God bless you all. Sing song.